The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming along to our webinar today. I'm Sarah Billany and I'm the com Customer Community Manager for Softlink here in the UK um, and have the pleasure of working with lots of you to develop your knowledge of our LMS Oliver. Um, today we will be taking a closer look at the reading framework, uh, originally published a couple of years ago but was updated by the Department for Education in July this year. Um, I have the absolute pleasure today of welcoming along Alison Tarrant, who is CEO of the School Library Association, who will be sharing her perspective of the framework, which I'm really looking forward to hearing, and I'm sure you guys are too. Um, so welcome, Alison, and thanks so much for, for being with us today. Morning, Sarah. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's okay. Um, so as as always, um, the webinar will be recorded and sent out to everyone who who registered, um, most likely early next week. Questions can be asked by the question box. So if some of you guys just want to drop a hello into the question box, just so we can make sure that um, your hearing is okay, that would be great. Um, so you can use the question box. And we'll do our best to respond to your questions kind of throughout the session. Uh, however, please don't worry if we don't get around to answering during the session. Um, I will keep a record of any questions that have been asked and we'll make sure that we contact people directly if questions go unanswered. Um, PowerPoints are available for you to download from the GoToWebinar panel, uh, along with the certificate of attendance. So please feel free to grab those before you log off the session today. Um, it's going to begin with a talk from Alison, followed by my presentation about how Oliver can support certain aspects of the framework. Um, so it's my pleasure to hand you over to Alison, who is going to kick off today's webinar. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Sarah. As I say, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to um, be able to see so many people attending this morning. Um, as Sarah said, do pop a message into the chat. I'm not sure that I can see it, actually, Sarah, can I? It's it's the one that's called questions rather than the chat. If you can no, see okay. it, don't worry. Then... Oh, they'll, they'll just be a surprise oh. for you, Alison. You'll... <laughs> we do love a surprise. Um, so yeah, so brilliant. So if you pop your comments or questions into the questions box, Sarah will put the questions to me at the end of the session. Um, but just to introduce myself, my name is Alison Tarrant and as Sarah said, I am the Chief Exec of the School Library Association. Um, and before that, I was a school librarian myself, um, worked in a secondary school and very closely with our primary feeders and um, yeah, implemented a brand new uh, school library in a secondary school. So um, if you just pop on to the next slide, Sarah, if you don't know the School Library Association, we support anyone involved with school libraries, building a reading culture or their research and information literacy. Um, so whatever it is that you're doing, we provide training, networks and advice line etc so that you and up to nine other people in your school can all benefit from your school library association membership so we are at the sla as you might um expect kind of you know really familiar with the reading framework and what that means and on the next slide is just i thought it was worth kind of taking a step back and just thinking about the context in, in which we're all working because you know the as Sarah said it, the reading framework was originally put out a couple of years ago and then it was updated kind of post covid so the first point that I have put there is just about the impact of the cost of living crisis uh, there we go so this will impact kind of what you do or it's just worth being aware of in terms of what you do in multiple ways. 
So book ownership is likely to decrease over this period. Um, ability to focus for children, for many children, is likely to decrease. So that might impact the kinds of books that you're recommending or how you plan your lesson time. Um, you might find that parents and carers in your school community have got less time to read with pu pupils um, or to talk to them about what they're doing as they are kind of either just worried about stuff and have less mental capacity or are working multiple jobs or taking on overtime, all of that thing. So there's a lot to be aware of. There's also kind of the highlighted role of empathy post COVID. That's definitely come out of a lot of the conversations around the importance of reading. And that's definitely something that we can build into our day to day work in a you know in a school library and in the discussions that you're having with pupils the third point is around relying on parents and carers so i've just mentioned they might be looking at things in particular ways and you guys will be the experts of in your kind of school community on what your kind of parents and carers your community as a whole are going through but just relying on them to know and to understand why reading is important and what to do about it isn't isn't enough. You know, that knowledge is not widely spread throughout a lot of parents. There's been research that shows that. So there is a role for school librarians and school library staff in supporting all of the community to build and to pick up and to kind of take forward the reading culture that you build within the school. Thinking about that and thinking about knowledge and what we know and what we don't know, there has been lots of research over the past couple of years around the importance of, children, of teachers' ch knowledge of children's literature and it doesn't tend to be as good as it could be. So thinking about, you know, where that is likely to be, we know that teachers are incredibly busy. We know they have incredibly high workloads. So what are the ways that we can kind of build sh that sharing of knowledge into your day to day work so that that reading culture becomes something which is lived and breathed and that every every staff member in school can support? Um, and then finally, just thinking about the context as a whole, thinking about equality, diversity and inclusion through what you do in the school library. So lots of schools have made increased efforts over the past couple of years to really look at their equality, diversity and inclusion. And the school library has a really active role to be playing in that, both through resource provision, consideration around um, resource lists um, and making sure that the school library is an active part of any EDI conversation that's going on elsewhere in the school. So that's kind of the context. Now the reading framework actually starts with a really helpful overview around the importance of reading and this is something that I tend to do in all my training so forgive me if you have seen this slide before but I think it really pulls together those main core um, pieces around why reading is important so you've got the well-being element you've got the vocab element you've got the emotional development element happiness uh, you know, critical thinking is something that we're getting a lot of discussion around. And then this all important quote in the yellow at the bottom from the OECD, which highlights that reading is more important for children's educational success than their family's socioeconomic status. And that really, you know, speaks volumes in terms of the impact that reading can have. But none of those are my favourite quotes around the importance of reading. The fact that I have a favourite quote around the importance of reading kind of speaks volumes about um, how geeky I actually am about this. But on the next slide, 
is my favourite quote. And this is it. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to read that. It finishes by saying, furthermore, There we go. And then Sorry, just to finish it. That's all right. No. And just to finish it, because I am librarian through and through, <laughs> there's my reference. reference. <laughs> um, so this is my favourite quote because we cannot understate the importance of reading because the consequences are reciprocal and exponential. So the more you read, the more you benefit from it. And that benefit never stops. Now, that has profound impact on, on everything that we do. So the reading, building on the reading, making sure, you know, children are have the option to read, you know, is, is beneficial in and of itself. But that benefit never stops giving. And I think that's incredibly important for thinking about access so the hours that your school library is open the resources that you're providing it's incredibly important but it's also incredibly important from an aspect of what about those children who don't like reading because if you benefit from the act of reading in and of itself you inherently are kind of being you, there's a lack of benefit that you get from not reading so if we want all children to succeed, we've got to make sure that all children are moving with us to, to feel those benefits and to have them the most of them. Now, the next slide is just a list of references from my previous um, uh, coloured quotes. So they're all there if you want them. Also on the SLA website, we do have for members a PowerPoint that you can download all around the importance of reading. So if you want to do a presentation around this for staff or for parents, you don't have to start from scratch. You can download it either through using the quotes that are here and building your own, or if you are an SLA member, just from downloading it from our website. So the reading framework starts with that kind of recap around the importance of reading and then it moves on to the importance of reading aloud and Farshaw or how to read aloud and Farshaw have done some new research in this where they put um, worked with schools to put in a, um, a story time each day. So teachers read to children for at least 20 minutes each day purely for enjoyment with no formal teaching attached and they worked over 12 weeks with um, across um, 3,000 children in years three four and five so this story time happened every single day for one term and you can see the results there um, increased attainment on both reading and comprehension improved well-being and both um, children want to continue the story time, but also teachers want to continue the story time. And they felt it had a really positive impact on their, not only their mental health in terms of teachers, but also their bond with the class. And I think, you know, when we think back to, when you hear stories of people thinking back to their childhood or, when they've had a story read aloud to them, that tends to be quite an emotional memory that they recall. You know, I remember being in primary school and my head teacher reading to me the twits and he was sat underneath the projector and they'd project the um, classic old school OHP um, projector and projecting the illustrations and just reading the text aloud. And that definitely contributed to my love for reading. And one of the things that's quite often overlooked when it comes to reading aloud is that it's inherently accessible. So it doesn't matter if children are incredibly gifted at reading or if they really struggle. If they are sat there listening to someone read, you are giving them the opportunity to lose themselves in that story 
and you're removing the barrier. So you're removing the thing that makes reading difficult and you're letting them experience the thing that makes reading worthwhile, which is the pleasure of it. They're getting lost in the story. So it's absolutely something that is, is vital. It's really important at secondary as much as at primary. You know, what you do is the same thing. You read books aloud. How you do it is different. And the text that you read will obviously be different. But it's equally, you know, good for all pupils and you can make it stretching. And there's been so much research around the benefits of it um, that it's just really worth kind of having a look at and seeing if you can build in that time. You know, if you've got library lessons where currently everyone is just sat down and reading independently, perhaps you want to have a think around whether there's an opportunity to build in 10 minutes of reading aloud to start that lesson. Um, and you'll have ideas around how you could build that in. The reading framework also talks about the choosing and the organising of books. <clears throat> so this is a, an area where I agree with quite a lot of what the reading framework says, and I disagree with some areas of what the reading framework says. So it is worth having a look at it for yourselves and just kind of breaking it down and thinking about it in your context and how it would work for your school. There is a lot of discussion in the reading framework about making sure that books are accessible and that children are reading books which are at an appropriate level for them. Now, I completely understand that and I think that is important, particularly when children are learning how to read and making sure that it's books are approached in a way that gives them sufficient scaffolding and the support that they need, whether that's to do with the mechanics of reading or whether it's about the, the context and the comprehension and the subject matter that they encounter. You know, we need to make sure that that scaffolding and that support is there for all children. I would encourage you, and this is why it's number one, to think quite carefully about stigma being attached and some of the unsaid messages that we can send through how we organise our books and through how we make them accessible. So one of the SLA members at our weekend course this year spoke about incredibly movingly spoke about how she had um, been doing a lot of work on the quick reads collection that she had and um, and was trying to kind of really boost it and one of the pupils that she was trying to work with and to encourage to borrow from this collection said to her one day you know it might be a quick read for you miss but for me that's not and it really caused her to just stop and think about oh actually that's right, like it is a quick read for me, but for these children that I'm encouraging, to, trying to encourage to read them, I'm not, and I'm actually kind of almost adding to a barrier that's there. So she renamed the collection, I think she called them Small and Mighty um, books, which I absolutely love, because it immediately turns it into a much more kind of positive, empowering um, collection to borrow from rather than a quick read which can be either off-putting because it's not that quick for you um or it can be slightly diminutive oh it's a quick read so you'll you know you'll get through it and you'll bring it back but small and mighty i think you know packs a punch so thinking quite carefully and inclusively around what we call our collections and making sure that we're listening to the children that we want to be borrowing them and number two is around staff influences. So the SLA has a platform where we have an attitude to reading survey. And we worked with Teresa Kremin from the Open University and Bounce Together, who provides the platform, to look at some of the results of that attitude to reading survey. And this was um, from a report which Teresa Kremin wrote for us where half of their, those pupils that answered the survey said that they would look at the shelves 
to find their next book. And I think there's a question there around actually what, what does looking at the shelf mean? Is that an active look or is that a, I'm just going to gaze with my eyes half closed until I see something that's um, very, very appealing? And only 14% said that they would ask an adult. So I think there's a bit of a challenge there for, for library staff. And I think there's lots of things that we can do to overcome that and to change that. So one um, is one which we'll come on to shortly, which is around choice and motivation. One is around respect. I think anytime we're talking about reading for pleasure or building a reading culture, we've got to be thinking about respect that underpins that because you you can't just force children to read for pleasure. You've got to try and entice them or encourage them or cajole them or, you know, unrelentingly keep recommending books until you hit one that they like. So thinking about how active your kind of your staff team are as influencers, are they talking about books? Are books visible? Is reading something that they're shown to be doing? And so much of this conversation is around modelling reading and modelling choosing books and modelling what a reader looks like. All of the staff in the school need to be engaged with that. As do pupils. So it will be no surprise to anyone on this call that peer to peer influence is a significant factor. And a lot of children who answered the attitude to reading survey said that they would take recommendations from their peers. So encouraging children to talk to each other around what they're reading, what books they like, what books they don't like, is a really important part of building an active reading culture. Um, so not being worried about that book talk and that book discussion, but building in time for those discussions to happen. I've mentioned the importance of respect and that comes down to as well choice and motivation. So pupils choosing for themselves what they want to read and that might be having a book that they learn from in terms of learning how to read and decoding and having a secondary book that they read for fun which is one that they have chosen. It might be around to the format of what they're reading so supplying graphic novels or magazines to allow them to have that choice and as I mentioned it you can't you know set a child down and force them to read for pleasure so you've got to find a way of tapping into that individual and giving them the motivation to read for themselves and the reading framework makes a really interesting point around the relevance and importance of rewards because what you're trying to do when you're encouraging a child to read for pleasure is to give them that internal intrinsic motivation to read for themselves and because they want to and the reading framework questions whether external rewards can do that um, they recommend making sure that any rewards are book related i kind of question that you know that's great for those children who love reading they're going to read and they're going to get rewarded with something that enables them to read more but for those children who don't like reading that reward isn't going to be a reward because they don't like reading and i think i worry that that increases the disparity between our readers and our not readers instead of leveling them up so i think there is a role for rewards I think you do need to be careful and, and use them in a considered way when it comes to the intrinsic extrinsic motivation argument. But I have found, you know, and you will know in your school, the things that work for your community, whether that is, you know, passes to skip the lunch queue or house points, but it's always only ever a kind of a starting point. You need to find something to hook those children in to get them reading initially and then try and move that on so it becomes more of a kind of natural personal motivation rather than only ever relying on those external rewards. The framework also talks quite widely around building a reading for pleasure culture. Um, 
So I just put together five top tips. It's a whole training session in and of itself. The SLA have a document called Get Everyone Reading, which is freely available to download from our website. Um, but here are my top five tips. It is not a culture if it's just you talking about it. That's number one. <laughs> OK, so it can't just be reliant on you as the literacy lead, as the reading champion, as the librarian, whatever your title is, it cannot just be you. So think about what you need to do to make sure that that reading for pleasure culture is embedded across the school, across the year groups, across the subjects and that every teacher and every member of school staff understands their role. Now, earlier on, I was talking about the importance of children's, of teachers' knowledge of children's literature. And that was very specific because the research that has been done has been done on teachers and specifically their knowledge. But when we at the SLA talk about be, building a reading for pleasure culture, we are very purposeful about the fact that it should be all staff. Not all teachers, not all children will identify with teachers. So we need to make sure that every child has a reading role model that they look up to. So get your, your site team um, talking about reading, get your catering team you know, talking about reading and showing the children that they read, your TAs, your science um, laboratory assistants, whoever it is in the school, you know, just try and diversify what a reader looks like. But it also needs to, meet, needs to reach much wider than that. So thinking about how do we extend that out to parents and, parents and carers? How do we push that out to groups or organisations that the pupils are spending their time with beyond school? Are there particular leaders in your community that you could read, to reach out to? to do some reading promotion and to again kind of show that everyone is a reader and this is what it looks like in this context. It needs to be built on respect and enthusiasm so you know setting detentions where children just read or is that really sending the right message is that what you want to be saying readings a punishment um you know I, I get it sometimes it's a necessary evil but, you know, thinking again about those kind of unsaid messages, what are the, the things that we are showing pupils rather than the things that they are telling, that we're telling them? We all know that children are so quick to pick up when we're not being authentic about something. So just trying to kind of consider that in a really holistic and whole school way. It's about building those links between the individual readers and the books or the resources that they have. So know the pupils that you're working with, know who your reluctant readers are, know what's going to kind of turn them. There is a way to get every child to understand what reading can do for them. It might not be an instantaneous, um, yes, miss, now I've read this and I love reading. It might just be a, okay, I can kind of see that in my future, that's gonna benefit me. But have those conversations and know the kind of logic that will work for them. And then be really clear about what counts as reading. So reading is one of these things that is overloaded with stereotype. Um, and we can end up really pigeonholing people or making them feel like they're not a reader because they don't fit into that pigeonhole. So quite often, you know, you ask a child, are you a reader? And what they will imagine will be someone, probably female, because that's a gendered stereotype thing, uh, probably female, sitting in like an armchair, probably next to a fireplace, reading a big old novel for hours on end. And that is some of the unseen, undisclosed stereotype that attaches itself to the act of reading. So let's let's break that down. You know, let's show that everyone is a reader. Let's show that different formats of reading count and are valuable. 
uh, let's show you that reading can be done in 20 minute snippets. It doesn't have to be hours and hours. So be really clear for you as a school, what counts as reading. And one of the important ways that you can do that is to know who your reluctant readers are, if that's a phrase that you want to use. So on the next slide, I have just broken down some of the ways that you can do that. So you can have your um, attitude to reading on a kind of set scale. So children will have a positive, negative, somewhere in the middle attitude towards reading. You can find out what that is. And then when you've got that, you can also combine that with your reading or with their reading age, which kind of helps you break down the different criteria and the different groups of children that you've got. And, you know, quite often we think about readers being high at high reading age and having a positive attitude to reading. They don't always. You know, you can have a high ability to read, but just not want to do it. It's just not for you as a, as a person. And that is a very different intervention that you would do from someone who feels negatively about reading, but who doesn't, who has a lower reading age. So by kind of combining these data sets, you can break your cohorts down and plan the interventions that each of them need. And then the reading framework also talks quite extensively around reading across the curriculum, which is something that um, we talk a lot, a, a lot about at the SLA, as you might imagine. So again, just some of my top tips for encouraging reading across the curriculum. And the first one is something that combines um, two of the points from the reading framework. So quite often when we talk about reading aloud, people again naturally assume that we are talking about fiction. Information books are great to read aloud. They are exciting and they build curiosity and quite often have questions in so you can get that engagement element. So don't be afraid to read subject texts aloud. And use them in the way that you would fiction. So similarly to fiction, you know, information books also can be provided in a range of format, making them more accessible. We're not just talking about textbooks, we're talking about engaging information books, we're talking about news articles, we're talking about um, journal articles. And again, part of encouraging someone's reading journey is to keep them exposed to a step or two beyond what their current reading level is. And when you're reading aloud, that's a really great way to do that. Which comes on to my next point, which is around using ambitious text with scaffolding. So a lot of reading across the curriculum can be quite off-putting because there is specialist terminology, there will be language that you don't come across in most fiction or in um, verbal um, communication. So making sure that the text that you're using have that scaffolding, have that support to enable everyone to engage with them um, properly and fully. And again, you can do that through creating a reading rich environment so making sure that every department builds reading into what they do and um, making sure that it's not just the teachers who are talking about reading but everywhere has kind of reading in its most varied nuanced you know complex way built into it you can make connections to news topics, you can discuss them in class. And I would really encourage people, you know, talking about reading is as important as the act of reading itself, because it's the talking about reading where you get to verbalize what you've just read, you get to check your understanding. In terms of learning to read, it's equally important. So don't overlook those opportunities to build in the discussion as well as the reading itself. And you can link this to being, you know, to the critical thinking side of things, varying perspectives, varying experiences, 
here's this new story in a you know a journal article here's this new story in a newspaper here's this new story as a video you know it will all add to the nuance of the conversation that you have um biographies are fantastic setting reading for homework if you're going to do that again be mindful of the scaffolding be mindful of that reader non-reader um nuance you might want to think quite carefully around how to make sure that all pupils benefit from the reading when it's set for homework rather than just your keener readers and then encouraging inquiry and setting opportunities for independent research again with the scaffolding making sure that that is supported and done in the best way rather than just to kind of go away and think about or go away and find out about um you know that builds reading in and makes an active thing rather than a more passive act um i can't believe how quickly the time has gone um but those are my top tips that i have taken from the kind of reading framework um i'm sure there will be some questions but if you do have any questions and i'm sure sarah will share them um but info at sla.org.uk you're more than welcome to get in touch if you want to know more about membership if you are currently an SLA member I will just give you a heads up that we are doing an offer at the moment where if someone joins because you recommended them you will get a free webinar so if you want to know more about that just get in touch um, but I think the reading framework is really important for us. It provides a real opportunity to make sure that, um, you know, the role of the school library is playing an active role across the whole of the school. And um, we're really keen to support you in you, you doing that. Oh, thanks so much, Alison. That, that was great. Um, it was really inspiring as well. I loved um, and so did some of the other attendees um, the discussion about kind of stigma and uh, things like quick reads. I use the term quick reads all the time in my training when people are talking about setting up collections and things. And I've never really thought about it from that perspective. So that was really, really interesting and helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> the term small and mighty is great. <laughs> Loved that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I really <laughs> love that. That was a shout out to Sharon Corbally. Um, that was entirely her bit of work and her talk to the student and um, relationship with the student that exposed that. But yeah, for quite a lot of us at the weekend course, we were like, oh, yeah, that's a really important thing. And I think so often because we're in the library all the time and we're just in reading all the time you really need to take that kind of moment and make the effort to kind of distance yourself from that and go mm. actually how is this looking to someone who doesn't use the library all the time or mm. if I'm not a reader is this just a really overwhelming experience for me so yeah 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 absolutely um in in terms of uh, questions there was there's just one really and it was um it came when you were talking about the Farshaw research and the um story time in primary schools and there was a question asking if you know of any um kind of research there where a similar thing has happened in secondary schools I know you said it's just as important to kind of practice the reading aloud at secondary school level um but wondered if you knew of any kind of um yeah research where that has actually happened there was some research last year that looked at kind of reading interventions mm -hmm. and they found that reading allowed a book that was a year up from where children's reading level was was the most beneficial way it was quite different because it was looking at reading aloud as an intervention rather than reading aloud for pleasure mm -hmm. um but that's the only bit of research and Honestly, I would love for them to be more um, or for there to be more. And it's one of those things that I think once you start doing, you really see the impact of. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that there might be some SLA members there, out there somewhere who want to do some research with us on that. Yeah. But um, 
yeah we um yeah it, i think there is some out there but it does tend to be more linked to reading as an intervention mm. rather than just the pleasure Mm. Um, I think it's it's yeah. tricky because I think lots of people have probably got their own personal experiences from whether it be their their own children or themselves. I know I remember very clearly um, being in year six and my year six teacher always finished every Friday with reading and the, the time she read boy and the moment he has his tonsils removed <laughs> at that moment <laughs> just like really sticks with me and I know my children are having similar experiences they don't particularly enjoy reading they've found the whole thing very difficult and the experience very difficult but story mm -hmm. time at school is one of their favorite times but it's kind of having that kind of um evidence in, in, in a more formalized way it's quite quite tricky so yeah it would be great if somebody was willing to do that um right so we've just had some more questions or comments come through um so one one attendee said he started reading aloud to to library classes in secondary school it's working really well the students are engaged and they encourages and promotes reading to those who are reluctant everyone loves stories so that's great Absolutely. that's great um, one attendee has commented that they interpreted the framework as saying that book bans should not be held in the library. So she's pushed these out to classrooms just to keep the library as purely reading for, for pleasure. Um, would you say this approach is a positive one? I think it depends what works within your context, mm. you know, and I think that's what's so difficult about releasing, you know, one framework that's supposed to apply to every single school. Um, it's whatever works for you, for your pupils in your context. So if, you know, if the kind of teaching reading is very separate to the school library, that's absolutely fine. You know, it might just be need it might, and I'm sure you've probably done this, but thinking around access to those books. So if they're in a classroom where pupils are, are every day, if they finish a book, they can get the next one pretty easily. If they're less accessible than that, it might cause a disruption in their reading journey. And therefore, sometimes it can be harder than to restart the next book. So just thinking about access, but, you know, try something ask the pupils, ask the teachers, see if it has a noticeable impact and then act on that. And that's the best thing that you can do is mm. just keep trying different things. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've got another comment uh, about requesting references for the research talked about. I think you had a, a slide, Alison, didn't you, with yes. reference so is that on? the partial research? Yes, I think so. So if I just put the, if I send it to you, then you can send that out. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I didn't, bad librarian, me. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got all of the references for those ones. There's a lot more research around the importance of reading. As I say, there's an impact page on the SLA website, which has a lot of overviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the partial research link I've just sent to Sarah, so we can send that out as well. Fab, thank you. And then just one final comment about... Um... Oh, sorry, the, the lady who asked about the reference said it was specifically about reading aloud intervention in secondaries. Um, so where you mentioned. Ooh. Yeah, I don't have that one on me. I will go back through my notes and see if I can find it and then I will send it across Sarah after this session. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then just a, a request if. And, and this doesn't necessarily have to be for you, Alison, but if anybody has had success in kind of finding somewhere where they can kind of um, locate good books to be read aloud. So, you know, identifying what kind of texts make good read aloud texts, how you make those kind of choices. Um, I know, again, there is there are some kind of suggestions for how to choose texts within the framework it, itself but I don't know if you've got any comments on that Alison how you would go about choosing a good text to read aloud or if you've come across any good yeah. websites um so I think the first thing I would say is give a shout out to Dawn who is the SLA's um 
advisory development librarian. She's phenomenal and she I'm sure we've got a book list on um, on books that would work for reading aloud. We also have a reading recommendations page. So if you want some suggestions of books that would work well for reading aloud for whatever year you're working with, you can just put the information in the form that goes straight to Dawn and she'll get back to you within a week with some books that will work. Um, number one, never ever read a book aloud that you haven't already read it can lead to the most excruciating toe curling situations <laughs> and so never just go off someone else's recommendation always take the time to read that book so that you know what's what um but there are some brilliant books out there and i think one of the things that's quite overlooked is how it can open up reading and that book in particular for children who for dyslexic readers, for example, names or place names can be really difficult because they don't fit with the rules that we're used to. So by reading the first, you know, first couple of pages, the first chapter, um, you can really allow, remove some of those barriers and remove some of those niggles that just interrupt the pleasure um, element of the experience. So even if it's not to a whole class, if you've got a small group, you know, just it's worth I had a group who, um, and this is me pre SLA days, but a group of reluctant readers, and I would just read the first pages of three or four books to them each lesson so that they could then kind of just inter interact with those books slightly more authentically without some of those barriers. So um, yeah, you can do reading aloud in a lot of different ways to make it more accessible. Um, but I'll talk to Dawn about the book list and if we've got one then um, I'm happy to send it across Sarah for you to send out. Great, thank you. That's that's brilliant and thanks everybody for your questions. They were, they were really great questions. Um, is, there, is there anything else you want to, to say Alison? Um, no, I think that's covered everything. Just thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this morning. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really glad you came. I'm really glad you turned up. <laughs> it, was, it was a relief. You know, when you have a moment where you think, I hope I've got the right day. I hope I've got the right time. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so so thanks again, Alison. That, that was brilliant. Um, so we're going to move on now to, to looking at... Um, how Oliver can help support certain aspects of the framework. So the, the reading framework is, is quite a lo long document. Um, it's over 170 pages long. So what I've tried to do is extract areas where Oliver can be of kind of practical assistance in some of the guidance offered. Um, so the aim of my presentation today is to kind of offer you some tips on how you can utilize Oliver to support very specific aspects of the framework. Um, where I can, I will refer to page numbers um, and tie it to the framework. Um, I've popped the link on to the framework on my presentation here. So if you guys download it, you can access it, it straight from there. Um, so that's on the go to webinar panel. My references are not anywhere near as tidy as Alison's. <laughs> so I do apologize for that. Um, now, before I get into the nitty gritty of Oliver, um, I just want to refer you to some really general aspects of the framework that Alison has, has commented on as well, that look at things to consider when, when choosing stock. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, and I think Alison's covered this in kind of a much more inspiring and thoughtful way than, than I perhaps have. Um, but I thought that these may be things that could support perhaps your collection development policies or perhaps be ways to ask for further funding. So I just wanted to briefly mention them here um, just in case it helps helps any of you out. Um, I popped them on the screen along with the page references um, and as you can see they are quite general but where it specifies things in the framework um, like on page 85 for example it ties the different types of books to different stages of reading um, and suggests that some students will need access to high low books so if this is the type of stock that you don't have in your library and um, perhaps this is a good way of, of asking for some funding for it um, 
Equally on page 87, the framework looks at concepts for choosing literature, um, one of which is reflecting a wide range of voices and characters, reflecting the background of the school student base and society as a whole. I know Alanson commented how a lot of libraries, we've done so much work in kind of um, really engaging with our EDI policies. Um, so if you feel like your stock isn't mirroring the diversity of your school, or perhaps you've done an audit to confirm this, it's here in, in black and white within the framework telling you to do this. So although we want to do this for the benefit of our students, having it here in kind of an official document might be another angle for kind of getting the required funding for these much much needed texts. Um, so secondly, on, on page 89 of the framework, there is a section that looks briefly at the organisation of stock in school libraries. And again, I don't want to teach you guys how to suck eggs. And, and again, Alison has, has really kind of um, given us a, a, a thoughtful perspective on this. Um, However, as I mentioned earlier, often when I train new Oliver customers, they look for a bit of guidance on the creation of collections within Oliver. So by collections within Oliver, I mean the collections you set up under this kind of management collections area here. So you've got collections listed in here. Okay. Now, these categories are great as they help students um, to find what they're looking for. They also allow students to filter searches on the Oliver OPAC and you can generate loan statistics by collection. So they're a useful reporting tool too. Um, loads of schools I've worked with use things like fiction, non-fiction um, and things like quick reads, which obviously we've discussed today um, alongside the concept of kind of stigma and things. So th that was a really kind of helpful kind of commentary on what, what is listed here and some of the options that the, the framework suggests for ag organising your stock. Um, if you are at a loss on what collections to create and how to categorise your stock in general, you might find this a helpful starting point to kind of mirror what, what you're going to do on, on Oliver. I'm not suggesting that you use all of these or that they'll be right for every school, but if you're looking for somewhere to start, this could well be it in, in terms of organising your stock. So moving away from the more general stuff um, to more specific things, um, page 89 of the framework looks at classroom libraries for primary schools and the benefits of using the main school library as a place to kind of regularly replenish classroom stock from. I think this section is kind of um, crying out for you to sort of utilise the resource box feature and all of that. Uh, whether you're a primary or a secondary school, you may find this a helpful tool if you want to issue books to classrooms in, in bulk. So resource boxes are essentially boxes of books that you can issue to um, a staff member to keep track of what they have in the classroom. So I'm going to very briefly show you how to set a resource book box up on Oliver if this is something that is new to you. So a resource box can be added from the cataloging menu here and you go to your resources area and manually add a new resource by pressing this button here. And then you give the resource box a title. I'm just going to call this um, the animal resource box and press add and then I'm going to manually add it. The resource record itself can be very kind of stripped back. You don't need to kind of fill all of this in um, in the way that you usually would. I'm even going to kind of adapt some of the fields. So um, 
not publisher, in publication date. I'm just going to put the date that I created the resource box. And it might even be that in things like the description field, instead of kind of having your page number and things like that, you might just pop um, that this is a resource box. So kind of utilize the fields as, as you see fit and then save it. Once you've got your kind of base record there, you then go on to add the resource box. So it's kind of a two stage process. And then again, you ask, you're asked to give it a name. So I always give it the exact same name that I've just given the resource record itself. You can kind of complete classification and collection and things and resource loan category if, if relevant. Um, the resource box barcode, that will be the barcode that you're kind of sticking onto the box to be able to issue everything within it as one, um, one issue. I'm just going to let the system generate a barcode here, but you would probably be popping a sticker on your box and scanning that in. And then down here is where you scan in the, the resources that you want to add to your resource box. So I'm just going to pop a couple of items in there. And then I'm going to create that by pressing this little add button up here. And then it's just asking me to confirm that these are the books that I want to go into my resource box. So I can finalize it there. And then this is what the resource box details screen looks like. Um, so if I were to kind of navigate away from this page and go and do something else, I could go straight to the resource boxes area here and click through to that screen if I wanted to add more books to this resource box, etc. Now this barcode here is my barcode for the box as a whole and that is what I could use in my circulation desk to issue that box of books to, a, to an individual. So I will, oh I've got a new badge and um, so I'm going to just close that and tick on that and then I've put my resource box barcode in here and issue it. And you can see that it's issued both of those items in that box in one go. And then if I go to return the resource box, it will allow me to decide whether I want to just automatically return everything in that box or whether I want to kind of check each item in individually. And then this is asking me, do I want to now empty the resource box out and all those books are going back on the shelves? Or do I want to kind of keep everything in that box together because it's going to stay as, as a resource box? So I'm going to press the cross here because I want to kind of keep those items together. So you could use this feature um, as a tool to issue a box of books to a, a classroom or form room and this could be swapped to each half term or so just to kind of keep replenishing the, the stock there. So moving on to another part of the framework uh, that discusses the need for a strategic approach in creating a culture of reading within a school and again, Alison talked about this, how creating a culture of reading can't just be down to one person. So, as she said um, very eloquently, a, a culture is, is not just one person. Um, some of the recommendations in this section of the framework include things like encouraging informal book talks that encourage recommendations from peers and adults and the opportunity for sharing books. Now, again, Oliver can't do this on its own, but it does offer some tools that will support this. So, for example, the book reviews function so pupils can see that their peers have, have read a book and enjoyed it. Um, 
all of you have access to, to the book reviews function, which allows the kids to, to write reviews and they display either kind of on the individual records or you get this kind of book reviews heading here um, to browse books that have had reviews written about them. Or if they come across a book on the catalogue that's had a review written about it, they'll be able to take a look and see what, what that is. Um, or having the function to, to share books uh, with their friends using the share function on the on the OPAC. Um, you've got underneath all the cover images, all of these different share options underneath individual items. So they can either send that as, as an email or they could copy the link here and pop that link in an email that they've written. I quite like the, 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 the web link, um, the, the email that gets sent from the first option here is a plain text email. Whereas the little web link there, obviously when the students click on that, it directs them to Oliver and shows them kind of the cover image of the book. And then they're, they're kind of in Oliver, ready to start browsing and, and do, other, do other things. Um, in addition to being able to share individual items, um, you know, you can share items in, in bulk. So perhaps um, they've done a search for a particular, a particular book and they want to add all of those results to the basket, which they could do using that button there. And then from here, they could share share all of the items in the basket. They're kind of given more options to share with in that way too. Um, in terms of the, the book reviews, if that's something that, that you guys don't have set up already, um, it is really easy to set up. I've popped the, the webinar we did about setting up book reviews on here. Um, if you're not interested in it, this webinar kind of start, starts with a talk about genres and the things you can do with genres on all of it and then moves on to setting up book reviews. The timings are listed, so feel free to kind of skip the bit about genres and go straight to to book reviews if that's something um, that you're interested in. So continuing on um, with the framework, page 94 of the framework talks about having a book club space on the actual timetable um, for teachers to promote books and for pupils to recommend books to each other. Um, on promoting books for a book club, the paper advises um, all of these kind of different things here um, as things that you could do. So there's some very fairly general things here, but things that Oliver can support you with, for example, um, include things like in recommended books. So if you like this book, you might also like um, the sliders on your browse list page will support you with this. So again, if I just show you um, my browse list page here, you've got things like recommended um, for you because you borrowed. Um, these are visible if the students log in. So it kind of personalizes the books that are being shown there. Um, if they're not logging in, they'll still be shown things like popular items, recently returned, new items, that kind of thing. Um, if they are logging in, they might also um, be accessing the, the reading level slider if that's something you've set up. There is some setup involved in that because you, to utilize it, you have to have been adding reading levels onto your borrower record and have AR integration. So if you have those things, that is something you could utilize. Um, just as an aside, if you're wanting to add reading level onto borrower records, um, this is where you do it. Sorry, I've got some little bits and bobs kind of in my way. Show you very quickly where the add reading level option is on a borrower record. 
so you can see you've got the option to add a reading level there if it's something you're wanting to do in bulk there is a csv import option for adding reading levels in bulk as well and obviously that in partnership with having ar integration is what is going to allow you to kind of create that slider on your OPAC that shows books um, appropriate to reading level if that's something you want to do and that works for your school so other ways of kind of feeding into that talk about books promoting books that kind of thing and um, you've got your series uh, recommendations which is one of the things again it recommends on on the framework find a series of books by the same author or illustrator and um, so you've got your series search option here and again if we use heartstopper as the example you've got the the tabs that show when a book is part of a series and if you're adding kind of series onto the resource record you can add part numbers um, and if somebody just is looking at an individual book on the screen like this you can see on the right hand side of the screen it'll show them other items in the series other items by the author similar items so again it's kind of feeding suggestions that that might be in line with what what the students already interested in and that looking at the next book they might like to read and um, one of the other suggestions is having um promoting teachers and head teacher suggestions so again, you, you could utilize the, the reading list function on Oliver. You could have reading lists created by different teachers with their favorite books or a single reading list that kind of has all of your teachers favorite books on. Or you could have resources featured on your news page that are recommended by a, a different kind of teacher each month that kind of thing so you've got your resource feature box here that could have a you know a changing book every week or so recommended by by a different member of, of staff not and as Alison commented on it doesn't have to be teachers it could be a member of your support staff and um, somebody from the site team catering team science lab that kind of thing um, or just encourage the staff to write book reviews so that these are visible on your OPAC as well. So don't just keep the, the book reviews um, for the kids, you know, encourage staff to use those too. Um, one of the other suggestions is to read a teaser from a book that will be arriving soon. So again, you could utilise your kind of media um, resource box and I've popped a YouTube clip on here of an author reading a section from a book so it doesn't have to be you that's necessarily reading the extract you could find something um, there that's already been created to promote a new book that's coming in or a book that's popular or that's being kind of used um, to promote something in particular at, at school um, the final thing um, on page 94 of the framework when it's talking about kind of um, book clubs and recommended books to kids and kind of how to do this and um, one of them is to, is to the last one is to in, invite pupils to register to read a book such as one that's been read to them and um, sign up on a reserve list that kind of thing so obviously if your students are logging into Oliver they can reserve books themselves so from the OPAC they can go and reserve an item themselves or if they're not logging in you obviously are able to do that on on their behalf so reservations is, is something that that you can already do on oliver so i'll just pop that back up there to kind of show you um that list of suggestions there So the framework then goes on to talk in more detail about the importance of peer influence. Um, this suggests things like advertising what others have enjoyed through classroom displays, 
signs and sticky notes in the books themselves so pupil who read this book also enjoyed so obviously as well as your physical visual displays or putting those notes in the books themselves pupils can also gain insight into what is being read and what their peers are reading via Oliver so some of those things we've looked at already with those sliders that are visible on the browse list page all of those sliders can be added to your news page as well so the, the, there's always kind of a visual representation of what's popular what's just been returned um what's new and um, there on your OPAC for the, for the kids to see it also suggests asking the pupils to provide two or three word reviews and um, offer them vocabulary suggestions such as heart wrenching and um, intriguing uh, page turner that kind of thing so you could use this work to encourage them to write those kind of reviews on on oliver it also suggests things like maintaining a top 10 list of fiction and non-fiction um, again you've got your popular resource sliders or you could utilize things like your circulation reports to find out what your most popular books are and keep an up-to-date visual display of this in in the library so for those of you who are not aware your circulation reports are under the circulation menu and you've got your reports area just here and usage with search criteria is the one that you can go to that has a most popular resources report. So you choose your report, pop in the date range that you're interested in, choose the format you want to produce the report in and press report. If you want to produce kind of a top 10 for, for perhaps each year group separately, um, you've got various different filters up at the top here. So you could choose to run that report just for a particular year group if you wanted to. So I think there is quite a lot to get your teeth into there. And there are different areas for you to explore. Um, if any of those areas that I've kind of briefly given you a whistle stop tour of today um, are not familiar to you and you need a bit more information about how to utilize some of these function, functions and um, I've provided webinars on most of the areas I've discussed so things like you know working with series in more depth setting up book reviews and um, creating reading lists that kind of thing just generally promoting the use of Oliver at your school so we've got kind of separate webinars on on all of those areas and um, so you can dig a bit deeper with them but please don't hesitate to drop me or the support team an email and we can guide you through your specific requirements um, thank you all so much for coming along today i can see a couple more questions have come through and um, but we've already or i have have overrun slightly so i'm going to kind of answer those individually if that's okay um so i'll drop you those of you who have asked a question and haven't responded to it i'll drop you an email in the next hour or two um a special thank you to Alison um, for coming along and um, really appreciate you taking time out of your day Alison to come along and, and speak with us all today um, um, so if any any of you have any more questions please do add them and I'll like I say I'll answer those um, throughout today and um, enjoy the rest of your day everybody I'll look forward to seeing some of you at our next webinar which is scheduled for the 7th of December and it's aimed at those of you wanting a bit of a refresher on cataloging in Oliver um, so yes oh I will just comment so somebody's just said that they can't see the top 10 report in Oliver and um, it's not a top 10 report it's just most popular resources and it gives you the top 100 so you would essentially just need to extract the first 10 on the list 
So sorry, I was a bit unclear there, getting carried away. Um, but yeah, have a great day, everybody. And thanks so much for coming along.